Grand Theft Auto has been around a long time. In the 20 plus years of the series' history, we have had hundreds and hundreds of missions to tackle across many cities, states, and console generations. Today, I wanted to take a look back at each 3D game in the series and pick out which mission in each game I consider the best overall. Obviously, this is subjective, but my main criteria is overall fun factor, combined with the mission's context in the story. A great mission gameplay-wise, with no interesting story, and likewise, a really interesting story mission with boring gameplay, are both going to be excluded from this list. In order for me to even consider it, it has to have at least some of both. So, sorry to the 2D era fans, but I will be skipping over GTA 1, the London PAX, GTA 2, as well as GTA Advance, but I'll be tackling every other entry in the series, excluding Chinatown Wars. With that out of the way, be aware that there will be a Patreon ad in the middle of the video, so don't be alarmed. Without further ado, let's get right into it. Now, GTA 3 is a hard game. Consequently, lots of the missions in this game are very frustrating and more satisfying to finally complete than to actually do, at least for me. This is especially true in the game's second half, but there are definitely still some missions in this game which can be a lot of fun, and for me, that usually means missions with a lot of freedom in how you go about completing them. So my first nominees are Cutting the Grass for Salvatore Leone and Sayonara Salvatore for Asuka Kassen. In both Cutting the Grass and Sayonara Salvatore, the game gives you a straightforward objective, but leaves the details entirely up to you, so long as you complete the given objective. This is definitely more true for Sayonara Salvatore, in Cutting the Grass, you have a secret option to drive Curly Bob yourself down to the docks, where you can then kill him however you like, but beyond that, there isn't a lot of variation. In Sayonara Salvatore, though, you are given the objective of killing Salvatore before he reaches his mansion, and you can do this in a variety of ways, none of which are explicitly told to the player. The game gives you the tools to figure out what you can do on your own. You can drive to the back of Luigi's and gun down the guards as they spawn, you can chase Sal's entourage in your own car and blow him up, or my personal favorite, grab a sniper rifle and get on top of the roof opposite Luigi's, and then gun him down before he can get into his car. All that matters is that Sal dies, but how you go about ending him is entirely down to individual playstyles. The next two nominees are also related in that they are both optional phone missions given by unseen characters, with less emphasis on story than other missions in the game. I Scream, You Scream is a very simple but fun mission which sees you stealing an ice cream van and then using it to blow up a group of mafioso. But the second one, Gang Car Roundup, is about as true to the name of the franchise as you can get. You know, beyond the mission in this game literally titled Grand Theft Auto. That mission just sees you grab three cars around the city. Gang Car Roundup has you acquire three gang cars around the city by whatever means you'd like instead of collecting three specific vehicles at set locations. This mission ultimately offers a lot of that freedom that I mentioned in Sayonara Salvatore, but with even more potential variation, and for that reason it narrowly beats out Sayonara for me, taking the crown for best GTA 3 mission overall. Appropriately, given that it's my first game of the series, and still one of my favorites, I had a harder time narrowing things down for GTA Vice City. My first nominee is the Colonel Cortez mission, Sir Yes Sir. In this one, you are given the task of retrieving a piece of military hardware being transported through town, a tank. Once again though, how you go about getting your hands on that tank is entirely up to you. This mission would often be a chaotic nightmare for me when I was a kid. I would die over and over again trying to engage with the military, but as an adult, I've also kinda sucked a lot of the fun out of it, with the way that I usually get it done in most playthroughs now. Just wait at the donut shop for the tank driver to get out, and then get in the tank and drive around the corner. Doing this is way easier, but kinda boring, and the real fun of this mission comes from experimenting with different approaches. Unfortunately, Vice City is an old game, and to actually retry the mission over and over is a bit tedious, even with Vice City's introduction of the cab showing up at the hospital or police station after being wasted or busted. Next up is the mission Rub Out. 
Like a great many missions and themes in Vice City, and another mission we'll be looking at later, this one is heavily inspired by the movie Scarface. Now, very loosely, Ricardo Diaz in this game plays the role of Frank Lopez in the Scarface movie, a likely inspiration for Tommy's taking over of Diaz's crime empire and somehow taking full ownership of his mansion. This mission is sort of like a more dramatic version of the encounter between Tony and Lopez in the movie combined with the shootout at the end, but that will come up again later. In the actual mission, you are given the task of reaching Diaz and killing him, and once again, there's a decent amount of freedom with how you go about achieving this. Certain things will always happen the same way though. You can choose to assault the mansion from any angle, but you do still ultimately have to go in through the back no matter what, as the front door is locked tight. The fun of this mission comes more from the spectacle than the choices for me. It's just got a great story, great cutscenes, and an overall fun structure to it. One of the most important missions you do after you take control of Diaz's empire is the mission Copland. In this one, you are given a little bit of freedom in the initial phase where you have to get two cops to follow you and Lance into this garage. Really, the freedom here is just a product of the existing open world though, because the game very deliberately sets things up so that two cops will spawn just when you need them, but that won't stop you from getting the cops to chase you on your way to the garage and just doing it your own way. Once you have the cop outfits, then you just have to enter the mall and plant the bomb, leading to a straight chase from the cops as you flee. This mission feels like something straight out of the movies that the game was imitating, and is once again a lot of fun because of the spectacle, but also because of the stages involved in executing Tommy's plan. The frustrating aspect is when you realize that dying at any point means repeating everything, and that is not uncommon to get wasted while fleeing the cops in the mission's final section. Perhaps you're noticing a pattern, but next we have another spectacle mission in The Job. A mission that is technically completely optional if you choose to ignore the Malibu Club as one of the assets. And, like a lot of missions in VC, this one also takes some pretty heavy inspiration, this time from various bank robbery movies. This mission is the culmination of the asset mission thread for the Malibu Club, and sees Tommy, Phil Cassidy, Cam Jones, and Hillary King robbing a bank in Little Havana. There isn't a ton of variation here that I remember, since I tend to do the mission the way that the game asks me to, at least in the bank, but even on rails, this mission is a lot of fun. Certainly the most interesting part is the police chase as you exit the bank, forcing you to think on your feet to escape the wanted level alive. This one is just so damn memorable, I couldn't not put it on the list, at least in the considerations. And my last contender for the best mission in the game is... The game's final mission, Keep Your Friends Close. This is that mission that I mentioned earlier, which is also heavily based on a scene from Scarface, the final shootout in Tony's mansion. Unlike Rub Out, which just takes mostly narrative beats from Scarface, this mission is a lot like the final shootout in the movie, with the main differences being that Tommy is not high on his own supply, and that he actually wins and takes over Vice City. This mission can be really hard, but it always felt like the right amount of really hard. A perfect ending to an epic story, or at least, perfect in presentation, as these games became more and more dated in their controls and mechanics with time. So my winner is Rub Out. It was definitely a hard pick between this one and Keep Your Friends Close, but Rub Out is ultimately more satisfying because there's still a ton of game left to complete. It represents the shifting point in the game's narrative, where you go from clawing your way to the top, to maintaining your position of power. The map opens up to you shortly before you do this mission, but it feels like this is where the game fully opens up to you. The conflict between Tommy and Diaz as well as Lance and Diaz is also just a little bit more interesting to me than the one between Tommy and Sonny, since we get to hear much less about the details. With Diaz, we get to see everyone's motivations, crystal clear. Tommy gets revenge for the ambush deal, Lance gets revenge for the death of his brother, and the player gets full access to the scope of the game, with assets available after the next mission, which is available to Tommy once he's killed Diaz. This one was definitely hard for me, but now we have to move on to the game which always seems to annoy a few people when I don't exclusively praise it as the best game ever made, San Andreas. But take solace, San Andreas diehards, I definitely still love this game. In fact, I realized while doing this that this game has a lot of really fun missions to choose from, the most in the series, if I remember right, 
and that made this a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. I won't go into details on all of these, but just some of the ones that I considered were House Party, Grey Imports, Small Town Bank, Mountain Cloud Boys, Ice Cold Killa, Hijack, Green Goo, and Don Peyote. But narrowing it down to just five, here are my final nominees. First up is Reuniting the Families. This is arguably the first really big story mission, although not the first with big set pieces. That would probably go to just business. But this mission represents a sort of turning point in the game's first act. This mission sees the player's brother, Sweet, attempting to reunite the fractured sets of the former Grove Street families with a meeting between the leaders at the Jefferson Motel. Unfortunately, the LSPD is informed of the meeting, probably thanks to Big Smoke, and the player is forced to shoot their way through the inside of the motel to reach Sweet. The first interesting thing about this mission is that you enter an interior cell, which is always rarer in these early 3D games, and therefore usually a bit novel. The interior here is completely unique too, never seen again and only ever used for this mission. Sadly, a lot of the actual fighting here is completely scripted, meaning the NPCs only show up at very specific times, when the player passes certain triggers. But much like a lot of the appeal to Vice City missions, the fun in this one comes a lot from the scale of the action and the different stages. The second half is definitely less interesting, because it's an on-rail shooter section, but it's nonetheless fun to do, and feels like a good ramping up of the action from the previous section. This mission just always feels really good to complete, and that has to score highly. Next is a mission I'm pretty sure I've mentioned as a contender for my favorite across the entire series, and that's Body Harvest. It's also only now, like literally as I was typing this sentence, occurring to me that this mission is a direct reference, both thematically and in title, to the origins of the Grand Theft Auto series. The N64 game, also called Body Harvest, was published by DMA Design, and predates the first Grand Theft Auto, being the initial idea before attempting Race and Chase, which evolved into GTA as we know it today. The actual mission here involves infiltrating a farm and killing a bunch of stereotypical raging rednecks in order to get your hands on a combine harvester, where the real fun begins. The game then sets up a few perfect opportunities for you to witness the cathartic power of running a combine harvester over a bunch of hateable NPCs in a video game. Never gets old, really. Despite often enjoying GTA more as a roleplay experience first, and far often less as a simple catharsis simulator, it was missions like this that definitely pushed me more into that chaotic side. My next nominee is one that I considered not including at all because of how frustrated it's made me in the past, but in most of my recent playthroughs, I've come to enjoy it a lot more, even if I can still never seem to pull it off using San Andreas' rudimentary stealth system. That mission being Black Project, given by the truth. This mission drops you off in front of Area 51, I mean Area 69, and says, find a way in, which is often the recipe for a very fun time. Black Project is a fun time, but it's also an exceptionally frustrating one, given the lethality of every NPC in the area except for the scientists, so I think that will keep this one from reaching the top, but it's still very memorable. I felt I had to include it, if only because you get a freaking jetpack in this mission, but I also strongly consider this mission's follow-up, Green Goo, which also sees extensive jetpack use, but I don't see either as good enough to be my absolute favorites, as good as they still are. Speaking of memorable though, we next have a mission that defies most of the things that I have so far established to be the makings of a great GTA mission in St. Mark's Bistro. This mission sees the player flying for a boring amount of time in a straight line, and then surviving a rather intense shootout in a unique interior, followed by another long, tedious flight back. Now, that description might make it sound like I hate this mission, but quite to the contrary, I've always loved it, simply for the novelty of A, getting to go to Liberty City in San Andreas' engine, and B, seeing inside a location from Liberty City that players of GTA 3 and Vice City were already familiar with. The mission itself is really just a linear path through some baddies, but the narrative of the mission, the setting, and the novelty of it all make for a mission that I always look forward to whenever I play the game. I recognize, though, that a lot of the appeal to this one comes down to member berries. 
However, the next mission's nomination does not, breaking the bank at Caligula's, which is an entirely optional mission, and one that I would often skip during playthroughs when I was a kid, because I found it so tedious. These days though, I always do it, and again, despite having a lot of things that I'm not a huge fan of, like strict linearity, I still always have fun doing this one, when I play it these days. Probably because of how cinematic it feels, another hallmark of a great GTA mission for me. This mission is also just satisfying, being the culmination of the casino robbery mission thread. It was the foundation for the heist gameplay mechanics that we would see in GTA 5. It's just always fun to see all of the pieces to a plan come together. This mission though also has that same problem that Black Project has, of being pretty difficult and having no checkpoints in the original version, meaning getting wasted can be just as frustrating and annoying as finally completing it can be, which is to say, significantly. The winner for me this time though is, probably unsurprisingly, Body Harvest. I just love this mission. It's so goofy and fun but still so GTA and I always have a good time playing it. The only potential downside to this mission is the occasionally annoying drive back to Truth's farm, but I haven't really experienced much of that while playing this mission as an adult. That's probably mostly down to not being able to handle the vehicle properly when I was a kid though. Like I've said, this one honestly is a strong contender for my favorite mission across the entire series. It's just so satisfying. Now, I'll admit, I'm a bit surprised. For Liberty City Stories, I didn't think I would be able to think of many nominees, but after going through the list, I found it a lot harder than I thought it would be. Liberty City Stories may be a bit of a step down in terms of overall story presentation, mostly due to the limitations of originally being developed for Sony's handheld PlayStation Portable, but despite that, there are actually quite a few memorable and fun missions in LCS, enough that I had to narrow it down, and even then I was able to pick six. First up is Portland Chainsaw Massacre. Now, I definitely would not have chosen this mission if you had asked me to make this list when I was younger, but these days, this mission is usually a lot of fun, even though it can definitely be pretty hard. The only goal is to survive Vincenzo's ambush by killing all the mafioso dudes chasing you. The catch is, as the name implies, all the guys chasing you have chainsaws, and they can, and will, kill you real quick. As long as you channel the power of Chicken Suit Cipriani though, and hop around like a maniac, it isn't too hard to survive, and actually becomes a really engaging endurance test that lasts just long enough, and ends with the satisfying death of one of GTA's most annoying tertiary antagonists. This is my town, Tony! My town! The next one that I remembered fondly was Steering the Vote, a mission given by Donald Love on Staunton Island as part of his initial mission thread when he tries to become the mayor of Liberty City. This mission is chaotic, funny, and has a bunch of moving parts which make for a slightly different experience each time. You have to advertise for Donald by driving his campaign truck around Staunton, while Tony shouts obscenities and slander from the van's megaphone. You also have to make sure that not too many districts fall into the hands of Donald's main competitor, Miles O'Donovan, and districts can actively be taken and lost during the time limit. For that final catharsis, you also get to blow up all of O'Donovan's vans for the mission's final objective. This mission is just a great mix of good, engaging gameplay and pure GTA silliness. Speaking of GTA silliness, Taking the Peace sees us gaining remote control of Polly Sindaco's car and then using it to interrupt a meeting between the Ferrelli and Sundaco families. This mission isn't very difficult, and if you fail, you don't get wasted, since you're only remote controlling the car, but it's just plain fun. All you're tasked with doing is running over all of the Ferrelli gang members, and the entire time you're locked into first person. It's just good catharsis all the way through. Speaking of which... A mission that is also a contender for one of my favorites in the series is Carmageddon. Given to Tony by the Liberty Tree reporter, posing as a father of the church, Ned Burns, the player is tasked with grabbing a fire truck and then going haywire. Your goal is to simply cause enough chaos in the time limit given and not die, but that's really all you need. This is the kind of mission that feels like a 2D era classic GTA style objective dropped into the more modern 3D era games, like the rampages in the first three games, which became less and less prominent as the years went on. That's not to say though that LCS only has cathartic, chaotic missions to nominate. Panlantic Land Grab, 
sees us fulfilling the GTA trope of killing a character who once gave us missions, but across games. And it also offers a nice bit of freedom, once again, in how you complete it specifically. The mission sees you assassinating Avery Carrington from GTA Vice City, mostly as an F.U. to Burt Reynolds from the devs at Rockstar for a less than friendly relationship during his time recording for Avery. Hence him having no lines during his appearance in LCS. You're allowed to do whatever you want, so long as Avery dies, similar to Sayonara Salvatore, but the window for failing is definitely a bit tighter this time around, I think. I usually end up sniping Avery right out of his truck as he crosses the bridge, but you can also chase him all around Staunton Island, and really get creative with it if for some reason you have an overwhelming hatred for Burt Reynolds, the way that Rockstar did. Cathartic creativity in a mission that also ties back to another title. Just a great mission overall. I had to mention this one. Speaking of missions from LCS which tie into GTA 3, sort of, we have Bringing the House Down. Now, the events which take place in this mission are never actually mentioned in GTA 3 because, well, this game's story hadn't been written yet, but the scope of this mission is truly nuts. Tony is tasked with blowing up an entire neighborhood on Staunton Island, Fort Staunton, which by GTA 3 is effectively just a new building development and a bunch of rubble. Well, this is where the rubble comes from. The mission itself isn't too hard. You just gotta drive through the subway tunnels and take out some Ferrelli goons, then plant the bombs and drive out. Gameplay-wise, I wasn't sure I should even include this one, but it's just so fun, and it's one of the few times where you get to permanently and substantially change the map of a game as part of the story. And my winner is Steering the Vote. It's not super complicated, it's not super difficult, it's not especially deep or grand in scale, but goddammit, it's just a really good balance of the things that make a great GTA mission for me. Variability, challenge, humor, and catharsis. I was really tempted to pick Carmageddon, but this one I think has a better balance. Balance, something that cannot be said for the entirety of the next game on the list, Vice City Stories. Vice City Stories has, in my humble opinion, the most dramatic curve when it comes to distribution of bad versus good missions. It has both some of the 3D era's best missions, and easily its worst, but we don't talk about Light My Pyre. The first notable nominee for best though is Having a Good Time, a mission for Umberto Rabina where the player finishes off the Cholos once and for all, using a piñata stuffed with explosives. What's not to love? It isn't super complex, missions in the stories games rarely were, but it's engaging, it's silly, and it's not overly frustrating. A good start, but it isn't very interesting in terms of its story or placement in the larger narrative. From Zero to Hero, however, most certainly is, as it involves the first time that Victor, and therefore the player, really gets a chance to hit back at the game's main antagonist, Jerry Martinez. You get to tag team with your brother, who is Lance from Vice City, and take out Martinez's goons, in order to steal his drug shipment. The second half then is a rush to your new safe houses, while Martinez tries to blow you up, I guess, which doesn't actually seem like it would have a positive outcome for him. The mission is also, like several in VCS, synced to the game's soundtrack, triggering the same song whenever you try to cross the bridge, Holy Diver by Dio. Holy Diver. The next nominee is pure silly fun, but it's a lot of fun, so it deserves a mention for sure. Brawn of the Dead. This mission sees you doing work for a director named Spitz, who is filming a zombie movie at the North Point Mall. The mission is dead simple. Play a stuntman and kill a bunch of zombies in a few different scenes that the game sets up for you. The only thing that would make this mission better is if Vice City Stories had the same mall music as VC, because sadly, it does not. Also, it's implied on the radio after the mission that all of the actors Victor kills here aren't just playing dead, but actually murdered in cold blood, and nobody cares. A very GTA thing to happen, and it makes the mission just a touch more amusing. Next up though, we have a mission that gets a mention mostly just because of how memorable it is. In the Air Tonight sees you literally defending Phil Collins while he performs the titular song on the stage below you. You have to prevent the Ferrelli family goons from cutting the cables to the light platform, otherwise it will fall and kill Phil, another mission from this game. Gameplay-wise, this mission is actually just really frustrating because of how easy it is for the Ferrellis that spawn in to just immediately start cutting the cables, but getting to see a literal performance of In the Air Tonight in the Renderware engine is just too amazing to not mention. 
It's like that time that Kiss was in Tony Hawk, but better. And my final nominee for the best mission in the game is the final mission, Last Stand. Actually, Last Stand is just so goddamn epic and satisfying, I'm not even gonna beat around the bush here. It's the winner. In fact, it's probably my favorite final mission of the 3D era, even more so than the original Vice City, if only because killing Sunny isn't very satisfying, and killing Lance is more sad than it is cathartic, especially when you've played this game. Killing Jerry Martinez, though, in a Mexican standoff on top of a skyscraper that you first assault with an attack chopper is just... awesome. No other way to say it. Oh, also, you killed Diego Mendez here, but... Honestly, I always felt like it should have been Armando, but... Maybe they didn't want to have two villains having their final monologue back to back here? Not sure. This video and all videos on my channel are brought to you in large part by the wonderful support of my patrons on Patreon.com. An extra special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and King GTA 15 as well as my Walker Villain tier patron, Michael Vandenberg. Patrons at these tiers also have the option to promote a little bit of their own content, so this video is brought to you by Ezra's Let's Play channel, Scott Games 99, Mason Collins podcast channel, We're About Everything, and Chuck K45's Upstart Farming channel. I release all videos a little early to patrons, and completely uncensored. I give you any of the original music tracks I've created for a given video, and for extra generous supporters, you can even reserve a slot for your favorite game in my ongoing series, The Game Vault. You'll also get to see your name in the credits of all videos that are produced while you're pledged, get access to a small patron-only Discord where you can easily speak with me, or see little behind-the-scenes snippets, and you'll receive my eternal gratitude. Seriously, especially these days, those of you who support my work directly are absolutely incredible, and I can't properly express how grateful I am to you all. Thank you so much. Patreon.com forward slash The Criminal Historian. It's time to move on to the HD era, and much like with San Andreas, for the next game in the series, GTA 4, it was not easy to choose. Some honorable mentions before I get to the actual nominees though are Blow Your Cover, Holland Knights, Museum Piece, Late Checkout, Tunnel of Death, Payback, and Flatline, all of which are great in their own right but not quite good enough to make the top 5. My first choice is the mission Lure, given by Francis McCreary. Like several missions in GTA 4, and a lot of my favorites, this mission gives you an objective but doesn't flat out tell you how to accomplish that objective, and there are a plethora of fun and interesting outcomes depending on how outside the box the player is able to think. The goal is to simply kill the person, a gang lieutenant who is chilling peacefully inside their apartment. You can find ways to shoot him while he's inside by calling his number, shooting his window, TV, or cable dish to get him to check and then sniping him, or you can actually lure him out of the apartment by calling his number at least three times, or even throwing a grenade at his window. That's sure to get his attention. My next nominee is the mission The Snowstorm, given by Elisabetta Torres. This mission tasks you with retrieving Elisabetta's cocaine at the old hospital, by whatever means necessary, and while there aren't a variety of pre-scripted options like in the last mission, this mission is a lot more like the older 3D era ones, in that you are just set loose to infiltrate the building, get what you came for, and get out alive. It really is as simple as that, but the added context of every mission in GTA 4 having a decent story, unlike a lot of the more niche side missions or activities in the 3D era, makes it even better for me. It's like a lot of the best parts of the 3D era meet the HD in this mission. The next nominee, on the other hand, is a lot more of the HD era flavor, but still one that I have to mention if only because of how memorable it is, Three Leaf Clover. Now this mission, along with the Caligula's mission thread in San Andreas, likely served as the primary inspirations for the heist mechanics seen in GTA 5. In fact, this mission is directly referenced multiple times in both GTA 5 and online, like when Lester alludes to Nico's involvement in it at the garment factory, Packy just straight up talking about it if you find him as a heist crew member, 
or him talking about it again if you find him as a heist crew member in online. The mission itself is a gauntlet of baddies, mostly, but a very good one. You have to first rob the actual bank, and then slowly make your way through the streets of downtown Liberty, facing some of the most intense police resistance the series ever throws at you, albeit entirely scripted. Not forever, though. Once you exit the subways, to my memory, you re-enter full free roam, and you have to escape as you would any other time. The mission doesn't have a whole lot of room beyond that ending section for creativity or variation though. It's fairly linear, but it's still an absolute romp, and a ton of fun to play every time. The next one is perhaps a bit unconventional. It's the mission Trespass, given by Phil Bell. It's not particularly relevant to the greater plot, and isn't all that memorable for its dramatic set pieces, but I love this mission. You're given a simple option of loud or quiet, basically, sneaking in through the back door or taking the front, and from there it's a relatively simple but engaging gunfight. The final part of the mission is definitely the most memorable, as you reach your target on the roof of the building and they attempt to fly away, ending up dangling from the helicopter, allowing you to shoot them or do what most people do and blow up the whole chopper. This one also feels like it was some of the DNA that went into GTA V's heist system, but it's a slimmed down, simpler mission with that added explicit choice. Finally, we have one of the penultimate missions in the game, depending on the player's choice of ending, A Dish Served Cold. This is the mission in which you kill Dmitry Raskolov in an act of revenge for his betrayal earlier. This is the mission which sets up Mr. and Mrs. Bellick, but in the moment it's cathartic as hell especially since Nico will experience gut-wrenching sorrow no matter what the player chooses. You just pick the flavor. It's a mission that offers a lot of freedom, but with a simple goal, something that a lot of my favorite missions do, as I'm sure you've noticed by now. The goal is to kill Dimitri, who is inside the Platypus, the ship that Nico arrived in Liberty on. You have to first make your way onto the boat, then reach the bridge to open the cargo hold, and then go down to fight your way to and finally kill Dimitri once and for all. How you go about accomplishing this is entirely up to you, but I usually go guns blazing because I'm impatient like that. This isn't the final mission of the game, more like the final mission fakeout, as we get what feels like a big dramatic ending to Nico's rivalry with Dimitri, only to be slapped in the face with the wedding in the next mission. It was actually a pretty hard call between this mission and the snowstorm, but ultimately I think a dish served cold takes the GTA 4 cake for me. Missions in GTA 4 can often be memorable even when there isn't much gameplay to speak of, simply because of all the great characters in GTA 4's cast, but this mission has it all. Drama, a cinematic quality, challenge, freedom, and catharsis. The only major thing it's lacking is humor, but GTA 4 is definitely a lot lighter on the humor, or at least the emphasis on it, than other entries in the series, so I think this choice remains appropriate. Moving on to GTA 4's first DLC though, with The Lost and Damned. Now, the first mission that came to mind when scrolling through my clips of attempts was Off Route, a mission in which you have to hijack a prison bus and deliver it to a drop-off for Thomas Stubbs. This mission has a number of ways to complete it. You can go right into the police station and fight through the cops, or wait for the prison bus to start moving and then hijack it while it's driving, which is much easier. This is one of those missions that just feels like old school GTA in the HD era, and it's just some good classic fun, something The Lost and the Damned was good at. Speaking of chaotic fun, Bad Standing sees the player taking down the story's tertiary antagonist in Brian Jeremy, and you are once again given a number of indirectly implied options on how to reach and eliminate Brian. You can charge into the house or try smoking him out by firing a grenade through the window, but however you do it, this mission once again has that satisfaction of killing an annoying character, along with a choice of how you go about completing the objective, so you know it had to be in the nominations. The real star here, and definitely my winner, spoilers, is the final mission of the DLC, Get Lost. Now, GTA isn't all about the big gunfights. Sometimes that's what you want, sometimes that's what's called for, but it isn't the series' identity. This mission is one of those times it was just called for. GTA 4 doesn't have a particularly big gunfight at the end. It does have one, sure, but it's more of a believable, at least in comparison, yet still very dramatic chase. The Lost and Damned, on the other hand, sees the player assaulting a prison with the help of the rest of the motorcycle club in one of the biggest gunfights in the series' history at that point. 
only topped by some of the ones in GTA 5, probably. This fight is big in scale, exciting, engaging, and dynamic, but most satisfyingly it sees you confronting and killing Billy Gray. People who watched my story ranking video will know that I enjoy the conflict between Johnny and Billy a lot, almost as much as Victor and Jerry Martinez, so putting an end to that conflict in this mission is always satisfying. I wanted to consider other missions for the best from Lost in the Damned, but I don't have nearly as much experience with it as I do other entries in the series, and while there were definitely some others I remembered, there were none that I looked forward to more when actually playing the DLC than this one. But now it's time for The Ballad of Gay Tony, the GTA 4 DLC which I did play back when it came out, and the one that I spent a considerable amount of time with, perhaps even more than the original GTA 4 if multiplayer is included. The first mission which jumped into my head is one of the early ones, Practice Swing. In this one, you have to first shoot golf balls at a guy tied to a golf cart, similar to another mission that I almost mentioned from Vice City Stories, but in that one, the golf balls explode. <laughs> bueno. Here, after you hit the guy, a second part of the mission starts up in which you have to shoot your way down onto the green and hop into another cart, ending with a mobster golf cart chase along the boardwalk and streets of Algonquin. What's not to love? This mission may not have a ton of that player choice I love so much, but it does check a bunch of other boxes and is just plain fun. My next nominee is Sexy Time, which is a Yusuf Amir mission and I almost don't need to say any more. The recent reappearance of Yusuf in GTA Online did not carry on his legacy of fantastic missions, sadly, but in Ballad, almost all of his missions are great, and it was hard to choose between them. I settled on the one that sees you infiltrating a yacht party to steal a buzzard. Now, the buzzard, to a lot of modern GTA players, is so 2015, I'm sure, but keep in mind, this was the first time we'd gotten to fly one of these in the series. And it was a substantial and intentional upgrade from the game's existing attack chopper, the Annihilator, which only had a machine gun and no rockets. The buzzard, then, was GTA 4's response to San Andreas's Hunter, and it filled that role perfectly. So, this mission starts great by giving you a nice open objective and some freedom in how you go about specifically reaching the buzzard. And finally, the opportunity to blow up the yacht that you just boarded. This is a set piece, there aren't any more yachts just floating out in the water, so you can only do this during this mission, but still, super satisfying, very GTA. Did I say that I chose between the Yusef missions? Well, I lied. The next one I had to at least consider was Caught With Your Pants Down, and if Sexy Time's introduction of the buzzard was Rockstar's response to players wanting a better attack chopper, this mission was Rockstar's response to wanting a tank in the GTA 4 engine. Now granted, what we get in this mission isn't quite the Rhino tank from GTA 3 or even San Andreas, but the noose tank is plenty of fun in its own right for what it can do to most of the cars thanks to GTA 4's physics. So, this mission is absolutely a blast to play, and is basically just Rockstar saying, Alright, you've played 4, you've played our Bikers DLC, now here's a tank. Kinda. Go nuts. Ah, but not so fast, is the next mission I wanted to mention. This is a mission which you see from three different perspectives across the DLCs and base game. I considered a few of the other crossover missions in various contexts for each list, but this one is probably my favorite. In this, we get to see Louise's perspective of the museum robbery. In other words, we get to rob Nico Bellic and Johnny Klebitz, along with the Irish mob, or Jewish mob. For starters, you get to fly in with your golden buzzard and then see a scene from a new perspective. Then you get a pretty great gunfight, steal the diamonds back, and fly off into the sunset. I admit, half the fun of this mission is just finally getting to see the last perspective, but it's still a great mission and definitely one that I wanted to highlight. The last one I considered is Dropping In. Now, for those who didn't play Ballad, perhaps you've already started to see how in a lot of ways, it was a response to some of the criticism that Rockstar got that GTA 4 and The Lost and Damned were far darker and less silly than many of the previous entries in the series, both in themes and in gameplay. Don't forget, GTA 4 did come out during gaming's infamous grey era, after all. 
So Ballad of Gay Tony reintroduced bright colors, more vibrant music, and a bunch of sandbox tools that were forgotten in the move from 3D era to HD. You already saw the replacement Hunter and Rhino, but this next mission is where we were reintroduced to parachutes. We could finally base jump again. Ultimately though, it was exceptionally difficult to not pick a Yusuf mission as my favorite, so I did. The winner is Sexy Time, because it's just such a sexy time. I couldn't not. But you know what that means. It's time to move on to the most recently released entry in the franchise, though not for too much longer, GTA V. Now, GTA V, much like San Andreas and 4, has a lot of missions. Narrowing it down was not easy, so I'm not even going to list all the different ones that I at least considered. Now, I did not just choose all five of the game's main heists because A, that would have been boring, B, I don't even like all of the heists, and C, I already did a video comparing the heists. No, my first choice is actually the mission Deep Inside for Devin Weston. This mission tasks Franklin with getting his hands on the JB700 stunt car by whatever means you would like, and that is already a description that I can get behind. Especially since GTA V definitely has a lot more missions which railroad you into completing them in an ultra-specific way, with far fewer missions that offer that classic player freedom, or at the very least, it often felt that way. Like, even when the game did have an alternate option in mind, it still very much tried to force you to complete the mission the way the developers wanted you to. For this mission, you can run in guns blazing and grab the car, or knock out a stuntman and poses him to get into the car and drive away, or actually play the part of the stuntman and be accompanied by an actor who you can later eject out of the car. But don't worry, her seat had a parachute, I think. This is one of those rare GTA V missions, which gives me that old school GTA feel, and I love it. The next one is basically the complete opposite though. All spectacle, very little choice. The Polito Score. The Polito Score as a heist, when considered against GTA V as a whole, is kinda disappointing in how linear it is. However, the actual mission consists of basically a trudge through a small town using miniguns and rocket launchers, which is a lot of fun. You don't actually do much of anything in the actual bank at the start of the mission, but once you exit, Trevor and Michael are wearing full suits of body armor, and you have quite a bit of health to go absolutely nuts on the apparently exclusively corrupt cops who patrol the town of Polito Bay. When Franklin comes in, you get the opportunity to drive a bulldozer into police traffic. Fun. And then flee into a chicken factory for a pretty intense firefight. Ending with the players leaping onto a very conveniently timed train, which was in no way planned since this wasn't their plan A. And then it's just made a little bit sweeter by being one of the better paying missions in the game up to that point. Especially with the disappointment of the last couple heists before this one. Part of me almost didn't want to include this mission because of how linear it is, but I can't deny that it's a lot of fun and I always enjoy playing it. So even if I would have designed it differently, or wanted something slightly different out of it, I still need to acknowledge that the spectacle of it is a different thing that GTA also does well. Sticking to that vein of more linear but suitably cinematic and over-the-top missions, we have Derailed. Now, maybe it's just because I am a sucker for literally any mission with a train in it. Fuck. Okay, it's definitely because I'm a sucker for anything with a train in it, but I do still love this mission and not just because it's the only one that lets you also drive a train. But maybe a little bit. Seriously, though it can be quite frustrating if you keep failing it, pulling off the successful leap onto the train as Trevor and then driving to the front to hijack it is a blast. You don't actually drive the train for any meaningful amount of time, but I'm curious if you're even able to say bring it to a screeching halt for funsies when you take control. I don't think you can. Even if you can, I imagine Rockstar fails the mission instantly when you do, so boo. The real fun part is the standoff you do against Merriweather after Trevor crashes the train into an oncoming one. This is a pretty good fight with some great set pieces, and you cap off the mission with a boat chase down the river to make things extra zesty. Again, not a whole lot of variation or player choice that I'm aware of for this one, but it's still a very fun and engaging mission to play, though I desperately wish GTA V had more fail conditions instead of just instantly failing you whenever you go off script. You know, when you get a bit derailed. Moving on, we have a mission that's just a really good fight, both in terms of its place in the story and actual gameplay, the wrap-up. 
this mission represents sort of the beginning of the final act of the game. Trevor and Michael finally reunite, and the stage is set for the end of the game. Before we get to that though, we have a massive Mexican standoff between not three individuals, but three organizations, the FIB, IAA, and Merriweather. Caught in the middle of it all, Michael has to fight his way to survival, and shortly into the mission you also get access to Trevor, perched on top of the structure with a sniper rifle and rockets, plus whatever else you've given him. The fight goes on for quite a while, but has some good moments, like Trevor sniping the guy out of the heli to save Michael, or getting the opportunity to kill Agent ULP, if you really want to, but overall, it does mostly one thing right, action. This is probably one of my favorite firefights across the entire series, though it doesn't quite touch things like Last Stand or Get Lost. It's still a great one though, and deserves to at least be acknowledged here. But coming back to missions that are more my own personal style, we have Lamar Down. Now, I have some minor gripes with Lamar Down, but they're more so to do with the overall story of GTA V than the mission specifically. The mission itself is one of the few times that the game gives you the choice of all three protagonists, allowing for plenty of player freedom and tons of variation and replayability. The mission then evolves into one of the game's bigger and better firefights, especially because, once again, all three playable protagonists are available to switch between. If anything, I kinda wish this fight went on for longer, and had more layers to it, but as it stands, it's still fantastic. The mission ends with a rather tedious drive all the way back to Franklin's house in the middle of Los Santos, but the conversation between Lamar and Franklin on the way takes up a decent chunk of it, and it's a pretty good one, so this mission checks story, freedom, and a good firefight. A definite contenda. But once again, I'm just going to instantly kill any suspense because there's no way I can choose anything else but the last mission in GTA V. It's the third way, come on. Now, maybe some of you are annoyed that a few times my best choice has been the final mission or close to it, but honestly, I don't think that should come as a shock. Rockstar, like any group of artists, would often save the best for last, and while that wasn't always the case for me, it often was, and GTA V's canon third ending is definitely the best the game has to offer. It has variability in that you are given not one, but three very open objectives that you can complete in any number of creative ways, and as each of the three different protagonists. It has plenty of great humor, like the guy filming Steve Haynes as he's shot, not even being able to remember his name. It has a fantastic firefight, possibly the best in the series at the Foundry, both inside and out. It has some of the best cutscenes in the game, like the one where the three protagonists figure out what their master plan is and it has some wonderful catharsis when you get to kill each of the game's antagonists and have all three together push Devin Weston off of a cliff. GTA 4's ending is like the ending of the kind of movies that it was imitating. Sad, introspective, thought-provoking, and taking itself 100% seriously, which for a game series like GTA was maybe a bit out of character. Hence the correction in themes with Ballad shortly afterwards when The Lost and Damned performed worse than Rockstar probably hoped. At least specifically and strictly talking about the final missions, I think GTA V's canon ending is not only much better than GTA IV's in terms of gameplay, but also more suitable to the established themes and identity of Grand Theft Auto. But the question remains, what then do I think is the best mission across the whole series? Well, I think it's a bad question, one that doesn't really have a proper answer since what game is most appealing to you can change from year to year or even day to day, but I'll answer the question anyways, screw it. When considering everything, my main criteria for a great GTA mission were mostly freedom slash player choice, story, humor, challenge or a good firefight, that classic GTA catharsis, and finally, overall fun factor. When looking at it like that, it's hard for me to say anything other than the third way is the best mission in the series. I mean, there are lots of other missions I enjoy, some that I might want to play more than the third way on any given day, like Body Harvest or Carmageddon, but overall, third way has a fantastic balance of so many of the different things from across the series. It's also very appropriate that excluding GTA Online, the last canonical mission of the main story in GTA V was the highest note. It certainly was a major accomplishment, but it also raises the bar significantly 
when it comes to whatever that first mission is for GTA 6. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I have naively high hopes for at least the GTA 6 single player, but only time will tell if whatever they do next is able to meet some of our absurdly high standards after so much time in the oven. Only time will tell. Until then, I'm the Criminal Historian, and I'll see you next time.